Congenital heart disease is a leading cause of birth defects, affecting 8 in 1,000 babies. Dr. Gary Seitu is the Director of Pediatric Echocardiography here at UCLA. His fetal imaging gives parents a window into their child's heart. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Gary Seitu. You are the Director of the Pediatric Echocardiography here at UCLA. What does that mean? Echocardiography is a term that means using ultrasound to look at the heart. The physics or sound waves of ultrasound are used so that a probe has ultrasound goes to the heart, comes back with the information, and then it gets projected on a screen, small or large. You can do it in a large patient, a child, or even a fetus. So it's the use of ultrasound by way of physics principles to evaluate the heart. What do pregnant patients need to know about their heart health and their baby's heart health? From a fetal cardiac perspective, I think a few things I'd want people to know is that in the human pregnancy state, while the heart is beating and doing a job, a lot of that job is helped out by the mom's placenta. And so the placenta and the umbilical vessels that connect from the placenta to the baby's heart is really overall what's part of the process of heart and what you'd wanna make sure you do have heart health and that would be placental health and overall maternal child kind of unit health. So while we think of it just being the heart, actually there's a lot more to it. I think that's maybe something that many people would maybe not know. How do you read an echocardiogram and what does it tell you? You sit in front of a screen and if it's in a case where you're performing it yourself, then you may be looking while you're scanning. Usually after that patient encounter, you need more time in a dark room to kind of go through it carefully as well. If you're just looking at a child's echocardiogram that someone else has performed or any other echocardiogram that's performed, then typically you're sitting at a station that has a dual monitor, for example, and one monitor might be showing the beating heart and various recordings of slices and angles and ways and measurements. And then the other screen may have a structured program so that you are reviewing pictures and then you're typing up the results of those pictures in a structured, organized way to create a final report for the patient or the child's you know, chart and to kind of permanize, if you will, that document of what you saw on that day. What exactly are you looking at when you <laughs> are doing this? So we look at a list of things again, but we're basically looking at the four main chambers of the heart. Are they present or are they absent? There's four main valves inside the heart. There's two major arteries. One goes to the lungs. One goes to the body, so we're trying to check all those things. Are they the right size? Are they in the right location? Are they working well or not? And so those are examples of things we're looking for. We look at the overall fetal heart rate. We look at how the heart squeezes. We look at some of the flow patterns in the umbilical vessels from the placenta, right, that we mentioned to the baby and to the mom and make sure those patterns look normal and, and so forth. When would a fetus need to get screened? So currently in the United States, not every pregnancy is referred for fetal cardiac specialty evaluation, but many are, and there's a long list. If the mother has heart disease, if a prior offspring has had a heart defect, if the mother's been exposed to certain infectious or not healthy chemicals or irradiation or other exposures of any kind, those would be on the list. You could go on many maternal disorders like lupus, diabetes, lots of different kind of reasons why a mom might be referred to make sure the fetal heart looks normal. What is a fetal echocardiogram? So that's use again of echocardiography or ultrasound to focus in on the heart of the baby, the fetus, and determine, again, if the anatomy and the function of the heart are normal or not. Now, do you continue to follow these patients after they are born? Yeah. Okay. Tell yeah. me about so, that process. Well, so a large number of patients, the heart will look normal and there won't be any follow-up instituted. But if a question comes up in the nursery or later in childhood, then of course we we can see them again. If we diagnose a heart condition, then we pretty much follow them for a lifetime. So what should a patient expect or a parent expect if they're bringing their child in for echocardiography? Well, there's not too much preparation. Usually the first couple of years of life, as you know, the child may or may not be very interested in complying. So usually we say from two weeks to two years, the baby may do their own thing. You know, in a place like UCLA, we have lots of tricks, including 
flat screen TVs and ways to engage the child so that they get a little preoccupied and we can get all the information we need to get. When the child's older, we usually explain to them, the sonographer does what they're doing and what they're placing on their chest and what's going to happen. But basically, there's not too much preparation. It's not hurtful. We're not drawing blood or anything like that. It's non-invasive, as we call it. Is there anything a parent should tell their child prior to well, being screened? Positive. You know, sometimes kids don't articulate fear or anxiety. Some do, but many do not. So the fact that a child's getting a heart ultrasound doesn't mean at all that the child has a heart problem or has one that would we would want them to worry about. We wouldn't want them to worry no matter what anyways, right, as a parent. Being asked the question as I kind of think about it out loud here, I would say maybe reassuring the child that the heart, his or her heart, is expected to be really great and we're kind of just going to look at some of the parts and make sure everything looks like it's where it belongs and working fine and not to worry. So probably a positive reassuring conversation might be something, certainly for the school age or adolescent child work. They may very quietly wonder, why is my mom or dad taking me here? Which am I, should I be worried? Is something wrong with me? Et cetera, et cetera. You are the past chair of the American Heart Association Congenital Cardiac Defects Committee. What is congenital heart disease? If something's congenital, that means that it's from birth, meaning during conception of a human or a human fetus, that the kind of bending and twisting that the normal heart tube does to become its final anatomy didn't quite go right in some way to create something that's not right. And so once the child comes out or with our ultrasound identification prenatal, we can determine that there is a heart condition. It's congenital because it's when you were put together. It's already there from birth as opposed to the term acquired heart disease. So if you have a normal heart and then you get a really bad infection when you're 21 years old and that gets to your heart, now your heart changes, that's an acquired heart problem. You weren't born with it, it wasn't a congenital heart problem. If there's a parent watching this video and their child has just been diagnosed with congenital heart disease, do you have any tips for them? Yeah, everything's gonna be okay. Okay. Yeah, we've been doing this a long time. We know how to take care of children with lots of different types of problems. We know the science and the long-term outcomes and generally in congenital heart disease, our field, even if you need open heart surgery or you need multiple procedures, the very large majority of babies and children will grow and thrive and do great. You have this amazing bedside manner, I know, because I <laughs> brought my children to you in utero. <laughs> What about someone who's watching this video and they don't feel confident or comfortable with their physician? Do you have any tips for them? If you're not comfortable with your healthcare provider, one option might be to consider, you know, speaking with someone else. There's many different personalities and sometimes we get along with one type of person more than another. If you have a physician or a healthcare provider, they may be very smart or may, may be very correct and educated, but you're not comfortable in their presence or comfortable asking questions and developing a relationship with them over time, which is very much needed for anyone with heart disease, as you know well, then it's probably time to find someone else, ask friends or family or other people. Your primary care provider may know another specialist that would be more compatible with what you're looking for in terms of entering that doctor-patient relationship. I coined this term heartquake, which is trauma of the heart. Being a heart patient myself, there's a lot of shame and blame that goes along with heart disease. What do you think of that word, heartquake? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, there shouldn't be shame or blame. And that's one of the first thing I tell couples when we identify a heart malformation is that it's really not anything someone did or didn't do. Although sometimes family or other people peripheral to your world might, you know, make you feel that way or some people do that to themselves. But the reality is that it didn't have to do with anything that was controllable. It just kind of happens. A common example I give is that sometimes people get lung cancer and they never smoked a cigarette in their whole life. So that's kind of an example of things just happen. Uh, so I think it's important that people don't feel guilty or feel shamed that way. Being part of a support group or having other friends or acquaintances that are in similar conditions or groups as you certainly is helpful and makes you feel like you identify with others that you're not alone. Thanks for watching Heartquake Media. Make sure you check out our website and social media for more information on heart healthy living. And remember, wellness starts with the heart.